Welcome everybody again. Thank you for joining in. I see uh, quite a high number of participants, which is, I'm very glad because um, it's always difficult to organize things and then nobody turns up. Not so today, of course, because we have such an excellent speaker, guest. So um, first few technical things, uh, housekeeping things. Um, I would like to point out that our lecture will be recorded. I hope you all consent with that. Um, and another housekeeping point is uh, do reserve questions for discussions at the end. So we are not disturbing our speaker in between, uh, but questions are of course very welcome and you're welcome to join into discussion at the end. Um, so let us immediately start with some science. Cognitive psychologist George A. Miller of Harvard University in 1956 published the most cited article in cognitive psychology titled The Magical Number Seven, plus or minus two, some limits on our capacity for processing information. We are definitely going to talk about processing information today, but the number seven in my argument stays for uh, seven years since you saw lectured in Slovenia for the first time. So very unscientific um, argument. Um, he has been definitely participating in various events organized either by Design Biotop, Drushvo Trita Roka, Alo Design Talks, um, as long uh, as back to 2013 and 14, and then again at Indigo Festival in 2019. And as you might know already, Yusuf Koponen is an information designer, data journalist. He's coming to teach us today from Helsinki, Finland, and he's co-founder of the information design studio Koponen Hilden, and co-author of a very interesting book we should all um, read, actually, Data Visualization Handbook. Um, he teaches data, visual, data visualization and data journalism at Alta University and other universities all around the world, basically, uh, definitely at Finnish universities, but he's very international, uh, renowned speaker. So despite his serious scientific agendas of information design, I mean, his visualizations tackle overwhelming wicked problems of environmental, political, social issues of our society, but you saw um, is also, I think I can say that because um, it's still, it is formal, but also because we are a bit informal <laughs> in our relationships, I think I can mention that you are the most enchanting and charming, you have the most en enchanting and charming fashion style and sense of humor. So that's addition to information design, <laughs> which I think it's very important. Um, so we are very happy that he's willing to share his vast knowledge with us today. I will be short, but I have to tell you the contents of this, um, this event today. This lecture is part of the research project, which runs at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design in Ljubljana, and is titled Models and Practices of Global Culture Exchange and Non-Aligned Movement, Research into the Special Temporal Culture Dynamics. In short, we're looking into specific historical documents and how to present them in accessible way for other potential researchers in the, air, in the area. So, of course, long ago, humans realized that lack of data, data is not a problem anymore in our society. The real challenge lies in why and how it is sorted and presented, of course. And at this point, um, I will give our virtual floor to our guest speaker. Yusa, we are really, really delighted to have you here with us today. And please do the share. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, that was overwhelming almost. Um, uh, I'll start by sharing my screen. So let's see if we get this uh, working in just a second. Hopefully you'll see the uh, beautiful uh, Mac OS background picture there. And uh, now hopefully also some little moving images there with the title Visual Insights. So uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure uh, being here. Unfortunately, not in person, but given the circumstances, that's uh, unavoidable, I guess, uh, for, for these uh, difficult times we live in at the moment. Um, it's been sort of a tradition, uh, not yearly, but but maybe uh, every two years or so for, for me to visit Ljubljana for, for a lecture or workshop or something like that. And uh, they've always been very pleasant uh, undertakings, and it has been a pleasure meeting people like Petra and many others, others there. Um, uh, I was given a very good introduction already, so, so not too much about myself very briefly, um, uh, if you're interested in uh, reading our book, uh, you can go to databasehandbook.info uh, where you can download the introductory chapter for free. Uh, uh, it sort of summarizes what the book is all about. So if you have just a little bit of time, 
I don't have the time to read the, through the whole whole book of 360 pages or something like that. Uh, then the introduction will give you a good good uh, sort of overall look of what what uh, the book is about. If you're interested in seeing what our small design studio Copenhagen plus Hilden is doing, you can go to uh, www.copenhagen-hilden.f5, where you can see some of our work, especially with public sector clients. So so. Um, Although I work in journalism and obviously uh, also with companies, uh, definitely my strongest suit or our company's uh, strength is lies with uh, working with public sector organizations such as ministries, municipalities, and and so on. And you can see some examples of that as well as other of our other work on the website. So we are a small design studio uh, founders, uh, me and my my colleague Jonathan Hilden, and then uh, two employed workers at the moment. So four of us in total. And we try to do almost everything you can do within the, the sphere of data visualization and, and uh, data analysis. Uh, the examples uh, in my lectures are mostly from our own work, but there are some uh, exceptions, which I will obviously credit to the uh, their creators uh, as, as uh, required. Um, so uh, without further ado, if you're interested in uh, downloading the lecture slides in a PDF format, you can find them from this address. This will be repeated at the end of the lecture. Uh, so if you decide halfway through that maybe you, you want the uh, slides and didn't take the address up now, you can you can um, um, take it later on and maybe somebody can add it to the chat as well. Uh, if they have the time to type it up, uh, I can't access the chat while I'm presenting with, with Keynote. So um, let's start with this sort of broad overview of the question at hand. What, what do we need? Uh, data visualization, information design, uh, and data analytics, analytics in the first place. I think Hal Varian, who is uh, Google's um, uh, uh, chief economist, put it very succinctly already in 2009 when interviewed by McKinsey Quarterly. Uh, he said that we have essentially free and ubiquitous, ubiqui oh, I hate this word, ubiquitous, meaning it's all around us, data. Uh, the scarce factor is the ability to understand the data and extract value from it. So we live in a world flooded with data. Uh, data in itself, although it has been called a new oil and so on, I'm not sure I, I, I particularly love the phrase considering we're uh, utilizing too much oil and other fossil fuels has got us into, but, but uh, like oil, data needs to be refined before it can be used for anything. Uh, uh, oil, as it uh, comes out from the ground, is a sticky, messy substance that uh, causes more trouble than good uh, as it is. It needs to be transformed into something else, uh, be that fuels or plastics or whatever, uh, before it can be of, of use to humans. And uh, the same is true with, with data. Data is not useful or valuable in itself. Um, it's only valuable to the extent that it can be, one, in one way or another, to be transformed into knowledge and uh, wisdom. Um, the problem of the data flood is well illustrated uh, by the figures that I lifted from a 2018 white paper by uh, Seagate, uh, which is a company that manufactures uh, hard drives and other uh, media for, for uh, saving uh, data on computers. Uh, according to the estimate of the company, in, in 2012, the uh, total cumulative amount of data in the world uh, up to that point that had been generated up to the, that point was, was six zettabytes, meaning six billion uh, terabytes of data. And according to their estimate, by 2025, the total amount is going to uh, increase almost 30 fold uh, to 175 zettabytes. And we are pretty close on this track as far as I understand from, from the estimates that have been made in the, in the, uh, uh, the this year and previous years. Um, we are already been for a very long period, a relatively long period in the in the situation that humanity uh, creates more data than it did uh, from until the invention of writing up until the year 2000. That amount of data, uh, the, the millennia of data that was was collected uh, up until the year 2000, is now produced every couple of days. Um, so the talking about data flood is no uh, exaggeration. It's it's a very sort of uh, exact. Um, uh, representation of what we're dealing with. So um, data is all around us. There is more data that you could hope for, but now the question is how to find uh, the nuggets, how to find the needle in the haystack. Um, as uh, Edward Snowden 
the famous uh, whistleblower, NSA whistleblower said, uh, if you are looking for a needle in a haystack, how does it help to add more data? So we need some tools to, to uh, work with the data deluge. And to quote Colin Ware, uh, who's a visualization researcher, or uh, actually a perception researcher, uh, in his book, uh, Information Visualization, he says uh, that most cognition is done as a kind of interaction with cognitive tools, such as pencils and paper calculators, computer-based systems. And uh, cognition, meaning thinking, uh, occurs uh, as a process in systems containing many people and many tools. Uh, since the beginning of science, diagrams and mathematical notations and writing have been the essential tools of the scientist. So what is common with these tools, pencils and paper, calculators, computer-based uh, supports and systems, diagrams, mathematical notations, and writing? Uh, two things. Uh, one of them is that they're memory aids. Um, Using these systems, you don't need to keep all the information, all the data in your memory at the same time, but uh, you can free your cognitive capacity for something else because you can refer to an external source uh, to support your memory. So that's one thing. Another thing, they're all visual. They're all accessed with our eyes. Uh, pencils and paper, calculators, computers, the interface is visual. Uh, diagrams, mathematical connotations, and even writing, although we don't necessarily think of writing as visual, they are uh, accessed using eyes. We read with our eyes. Uh, obviously, uh, that is true of most of us. Of course, there are people uh, who uh, cannot read uh, because of visual impairments who then use braille uh, writing or, and so on. But, but for most of us, uh, even uh, working with text is visual uh, as a process uh, as we um, consider how our brain interacts with the outside world. Uh, it's no accident that uh, the English language and probably all languages in, in the world include many, many um, expressions and idioms where seeing is equated with thinking and understanding. For example, uh, we have uh, the expression, oh, I see, meaning I understand, or, uh, oh, that's your point of view, so uh, that's how you understand it, or I have a vision uh, for our company, let's say, which means that I have some sort of idea for our future. But, but all of these words uh, um, relate to seeing. Uh, so does the word insight that is uh, in the title of today's presentation. Uh, originally first attested in, the, in uh, around uh, 1200 in the English language, um, it comes from the words in and sight. So, um, the, and the same construction exists in many other Germanic languages. So uh, clearly seeing uh, is very much uh, to us like understanding. They are not exactly the same things, but there is a strong connection, strong link between uh, seeing and understanding. Um, if we consider how we access data uh, uh, most of the time, it's by using a device that connects to the data source, whether that be a database or, or uh, some other type of uh, structure where the data is uh, uh, stored. And uh, the device um, access the information via, an, for example, API, meaning an application programming interface, which is a standardized way of, uh, for the uh, data source and the device to communicate in, in transmitting the data. So there's an interface between the data source and, and the device. But there's also an interface between the device and your brain. And that interface consists of the user interface, meaning the visual representation of uh, the system that you are operating to access the data. Uh, obviously, our eyes are part of the, the equation as well. So to be able to create insights, most of the time we use our eyes. Most of the time we understand uh, and access data by using our eyes. To quote uh, my uh, former professor, Tapio Vapasalo, uh, he uh, had, had this sort of quite a succinct idea in my opinion. The surface is the only way in. Although our culture uh, sometimes denigrates uh, visual things. It's not sort of considered uh, high-minded to, to uh, keep, for example, um, working on your personal looks or, or um, interior design, how your home looks. That's not considered serious. Uh, text, writing, uh, and speaking is maybe considered serious, but, but visual things are often considered less serious, less important. However, the visual surface is the only way we can access those uh, sort of more profound things, whether they truly are more, pro more profound or not. So even, even when um, the information or, or the um, that we are interested in, 
Thank you. Um, it's important to uh, drink water while, while you speak. Uh, the first time I was in, in Ljubljana, I made the mistake of not drinking while, while I was giving a talk and I actually lost my voice like half the, half the way in my talk. I basically <clears throat> had to drink a half a liter of, of water to get it back. So I'm not making the same mistake again. So uh, what I was saying is uh, the surface is the only way in uh, and it's no accident that visual uh, sense is the one, one that we use to access our um, outside world or, or uh, understand our outside world. According to research, uh, seeing is the most important function of our brain, at least if we measure it by the amount of brain capacity uh, dedicated to it. Um, about 26% of the uh, cortex, the, the outer uh, layer of the brain, where most of the higher um, functions of the brain occur, about 26%, so more than a quarter, is reserved for processing uh, visual information uh, if you are a seeing person. Of course, if you are blind, uh, then some of that uh, brain mass is then used for other things. But for, for people uh, who see normally, uh, the visual cortex is the largest single function in our brain, larger than our conscious thinking, for example. I think that this is pretty indicative of something. Uh, we use less resources for thinking than seeing. And uh, if, if we can think of these two things as separate, and I would argue that maybe we can't, maybe thinking and seeing are part of the same thing. Uh, this estimate comes from a 1989 paper by uh, Manfred Zimmermann, uh, who tried to estimate um, the total sensory throughput of different senses from the outside world to our central nervous system. Um, obviously, these things can't be measured directly, so th this is a rough estimate. But it's uh, in line with what we know from other research and what we know from our personal experience. Think about the situation where you go to a place uh, inside a building, a room inside a building where you've never been before. If there are no lights on, it's completely dark, how long will it take for you to uh, sort of get grips to grips about uh, what type of space it is, how big, what shape, uh, what materials have been used for the floor, for the uh, ceiling, for the walls? Are there uh, other people inside, maybe animals? What furniture there is, what other objects there are in inside? it's completely possible to get this information without looking in the dark room. You can feel your way around. You can uh, listen to the acoustics. You can maybe smell. Um, I wouldn't maybe go as far as trying to taste the materials around you, but nevertheless, you can use all the other senses to, to sort of understand where you are. But if the lights are turned on, it'll take a fraction of a second to get an overview. Once again, a view, overview of the space you are in. So, as I mentioned uh, many times, uh, seeing and understanding are, if not the same thing, at least very closely related. However, it's worth pointing out that, that something is put into a pictorial format does not necessarily uh, facilitate insights and facilitate understanding. American computer scientist Ben Schneiderman, who I love to quote, uh, has very succinctly put it as, the purpose of visualization is insight, not picture. The point here is that, um, in all uh, walks of life, but let's talk about science uh, because it's relevant to, to what you're working uh, with at the moment. Um, <clears throat> in science, we see way too often something like this. This is uh, a so-called a hairball visualization, uh, meaning that it's a network diagram, which is way too complex to be understood. It's a picture. It's a picture that definitely draws the attention to the paper. It looks interesting. You are probably more likely to, to look at the picture uh, than if this paper was presented without one. But does it actually help you in gaining insights into the material? Um, we, we as practitioners uh, are often uh, aware of the significance of, of uh, visual presentation of information, uh, but due to lack of skills or lack of understanding, the end result uh, isn't always very useful. This particular visualization, which comes from a 2012 paper uh, trying to uh, map all the links between uh, Wikipedia's art history articles um, ends up being beautiful and interesting, but not very insightful, in my opinion, at least. Uh, it's it's well made, technically speaking. You know, nothing nothing wrong about that. It, the the overall execution of the network diagram uh, works works reasonably well. The typography is okay. Use of color, um, well, not necessarily too accessible, but it's not terrible either. Uh, in, in the field of science, we see much worse. Um, but the thing is that, that the, 
central limitation of our um, eyes and brain's capacity to, to absorb information has not been sort of accommodated. And the end result is the visualization that is simply way too complex for anybody to read. I love the fact that if you look at the sort of um, inset zoom pictures here, which are supposed to you know, give you a better look of what's going on, they're even more confusing than the, the whole thing because there is simply going on and in the zoomed in pictures, you lose the overall context. You just see the uh, smaller area there. Um, so this is unfortunately very, very typical. Uh, um, in science, as well as in journalism, in other fields, the good practices in visualization are maybe still just forming. Um, it's getting better year by year. I mean, if I look at papers from this era, 2012 or 2010, and compare them to papers being put out now by, by uh, scientists, there's a clear improvement. We're definitely going to a good direction, but there is work, work to be done. Um, if you compare this one to uh, visualization that you may have seen or, or then not, but this is uh, uh, from Nevnik uh, by, by designers uh, or journalists, actually more properly, uh, Marco Plahuta and Alia Shvindish. Uh, this is a succinct piece of visualization because it uh, doesn't try to cram in too much information into a single visualization. It's rich, it includes a lot of visual uh, information in a visual format, um, but it's not overwhelming. There isn't like way too much to see in, in, the, in the graphic. Uh, it has been simplified down to a format uh, which uh, manages to find the perfect balance between richness uh, and uh, understandability. Uh, it's no wonder that this map uh, was awarded uh, the best um, map uh, award at Malofier, which is the most uh, prestigious uh, competition for um, news graphics in the world uh, in 2016. So, so this was considered the best uh, graphic in the world uh, for, for the pr previous year that has been published in, in the news media. So simplification. Um, we almost always have more data, more information that it makes sense to try to cram into a single visualization. If we compare this aerial photo uh, of uh, Auckland, which is the commercial capital and the largest city of New Zealand, uh, to a map of the same area, this is uh, downtown Auckland, um, we see that the map uh, includes much less information than does the aerial photo. The aerial photo includes things like roofing materials, locations of air vents, cars on the streets, uh, boats in the marina, containers in the harbor, uh, individual trees, bushes. We, we could probably see even individual people walking on the street if we zoomed in enough. In some cases, all of this may be interesting, but in most use cases, it's not. In most use cases, we're interested in a particular question or a set of questions, and everything uh, that doesn't help answering those questions is superfluous and, and uh, um, detrimental to the understanding of, of the topic. So if we leave most of the information from the aerial photo out and just show this is where the religious buildings are located, uh, churches, mosques, I think there was a Hindu temple and a synagogue as well in the, in the area depicted by the map, the map becomes much more powerful simply because most of the uh, sort of unnecessary information has been removed. But of course, the simplification needs to be done for a particular use case and particular audience. If you are not interested in uh, the religious buildings in downtown Auckland, then the map is useless for you. If you're interested in, let's say, sports arenas or in a completely different place, then the simplification here isn't right for you. And just to prove the point, uh, I want to uh, walk you through a set of simple visualizations um, that are different representations of the same data set and how they show different aspects of the data. And this is super important that when you start uh, doing a visualization, the question really shouldn't be like, how can I accommodate all this data? The question should be, uh, what is revealed when I remove certain parts of the data? and maybe you know, playing around a bit with it and trying to see well, what comes out from it. So the data set here is, is relatively simple. It's um, something like less than 50 rows. Uh, and uh, it shows uh, the number of people uh, hospitalized for COVID-19 in Finland. Our COVID situation is, is reasonably good at the moment. It's, it's getting worse, but it's still pretty good. 
Um, so we here uh, we see here um, each row is a group of people um, uh, by the their age, uh, their vaccination status, and then uh, the hospitalization rate, the number of people hospitalized over a two week period, um, and then we have the total uh, number of people in that particular group. Uh, if you're interested in playing with the data yourself, there's a link to an observable notebook uh, at the bottom right corner where you can access access the data and the visualizations and the code uh, that I used to, to create those. So um, this is a very sort of basic approach, a very sort of um, uh, simplified to the extreme in a sense. We only look at the share of people in hospitals how many of them have been vaccinated and how, how many of them have been not. And this is uh, at least one dose of vaccination because it seems that the single dose of vaccine gives you almost a good, uh, as good um, um, protection against hospitalization as, as uh, two doses. Then having two doses also cuts down with the less serious forms of the disease. But the most serious ones that require hospitalization, even a single dose seems to help quite a bit. At least looking at the finished data, this, this seems to be the case. All right, so uh, we see that 41% of the uh, patients in hospitals at the moment or, or over the two previous weeks in, in Finland uh, have been vaccinated for COVID-19. And this is a sort of interesting and important uh, thing in itself. Uh, but the problem here is that uh, it suffered from what sounds a baseline error, uh, sorry, base rate error. Um, so if you would try to judge based on this, whether vaccinations are effective or not in reducing uh, hospital admissions for, from COVID, you would maybe uh, come to the con conclusion that they are not uh, very effective because if 41% of the uh, uh, patients are vaccinated, that's clearly a very large share of them. So it makes sense to compare the share of people who have the vaccination in, in uh, hospitals to, to their share in the whole population. So now it's already starting uh, to look a bit better. So clearly, the unvaccinated have a much uh, larger um, risk of, of getting hospitalized. But I would argue that although this um, succinctly tells the sort of headline story here, it's worth digging down into slightly smaller details. So, so going back uh, from the simplification, maybe put a bit more of the context and data in. So first, let's look at vaccination status by age group, because I think this is important for understanding why this chart looks as it does. Um, nobody under 12 has been vaccinated so far, at least not officially. Um, of course, it's possible that some individual families have, have gone uh, abroad to get vaccination for their children, but at the moment, no vaccine is approved for use uh, for children under 12. So in that age group, we have no vaccinations. Uh, after that, um, from the uh, age group from 12 to 19 year olds up, um, the vaccination uh, rate per age group goes up uh, with age, with the exception of 80 plus age group being slightly less vaccinated than the 70 to 79 age group. But that's a very small difference there. Um, so this, I think, plays a part here. So you can already guess that because the, the older age groups uh, tend to have a better vaccination coverage, um, it's not surprising that um, some of the people in hospitals are vaccinated because they're more likely to be old. And that is revealed by this visualization, uh, this uh, stacked bar chart, uh, simply showing how many people uh, in wh whichever age group have been hospitalized for COVID-19 and how many of them are vaccinated and how many of them are unvaccinated. And here we see clearly that the old, older age groups uh, tend to uh, go to hospital with a higher rate uh, than the younger ones. And, and because they also have better vaccination coverage, that plays to this. Um, but what's maybe even more interesting, at least to me, is to sort of to be able to understand the relative risk. So let's say um, I'm, I'm 43. I have been vaccinated. I already actually had COVID as well. So I probably am already protected against getting a serious infection again. But if I wasn't, let's say uh, I was um, uh, hadn't got uh, the vaccination and I was sort of skeptical about it, should I take it or not? Uh, it would be interesting to see what's my, my sort of relative risk of, of getting uh, the, the um, disease without or with the vaccine. Um, one way of looking at that would be to look at um, the um, break this chart here into smaller parts uh, based on the groups that we can identify from this. So we can clearly see 
that the under 30s um, seems to have a very low rate of hospitalization to begin with. They're all un unvaccinated, but even the unvaccinated uh, rarely get to hospital due to COVID. Uh, clearly, the 30 to 69 year olds form a group that's uh, quite similar between those age groups, and then the two oldest groups are pretty similar to each other as well. So we can group them into these broad groups, the under 30s, the vaccinated 30 to 69 year olds, the unvaccinated 30 to 69 year olds, the vaccinated 70 plus year olds, and the unvaccinated 70 plus year olds, and then make the comparison between the sizes uh, of each group uh, to the their share of the population. And as we can see, clearly, uh, comparing um, the size of each group uh, to the number of people in hospital from that group, the two unvaccinated groups here, unvaccinated 30 to 69 year olds and the unvaccinated 70 plus year olds um, seem to be in, in a much larger risk. And we can even uh, visualize that. We can simply calculate the relative risk uh, of uh, being hospitalized by age group. So if we take as our yardstick, the under 30s, what's the base rate for being hospitalized based on the, the data that we have. Of course, limited data because the situation is pretty good in Finland. Um, for 30 to 69 year olds, the, the risk falls to the same level for the vaccinated, but for the unvaccinated, the rate is 23 times that. So much, much higher rate uh, of hospitalization for this group when they're unvaccinated. Interestingly, uh, for the vaccinated 70 plus year olds, uh, the multiplier seems to be uh, actually quite a bit smaller than for the 30 to 69 year olds. This probably has uh, something to do with simple random uh, errors here uh, because the groups are very small and also with the number of contacts. So people who are in, in uh, still working, for example, uh, probably meet more people and have more um, opportunities to get infected than, than somebody who is already uh, uh, retired and might, might be even living in an institution instead of uh, at their home. So um, this uh, visualization, in my opinion, tells us something quite interesting about the data that would be really hard to glean from the original table uh, and even from these more simple charts that we see here. We could go further and do this for every single of these, these age groups. For example, if um, our audience was a bit uh, sort of didn't necessarily trust our judgment in combining these groups, we could then uh, show it for each individual age group that this applies quite well for, for each of them. But uh, this makes it uh, slightly, slightly more simple. So uh, all visualizations are about comparisons. Uh, if I present you with this uh, bar chart with a single bar, uh, the uh, crime rate in, in the city of uh, Heinola or, or municipality of Heinola in 2015, it's sort of completely meaningless. There's nothing to compare it to. Uh, the comparisons that you can utilize in visualizations, that you, the comparisons you can make visually can be roughly um, put into these six broad categories. Numbers, ranks, locations, time, categories, and connection. I want to briefly uh, showcase a project um, that we um, did uh, um, uh, for, for um, artists Pekka Nittuvirta and Timo Aho, who in uh, cooperation with Google uh, Google Arts and Culture uh, created this, uh, which is sort of a artwork and a, a visualization at the same time. It's called Coastline Paradox. You can find it in the address, which is located in the bottom right corner of the uh, um, screen here. Um, so what we're seeing here is um, a map that shows uh, in the sort of worst case scenario, how high uh, the sea is going to rise due to um, a climate change. So although uh, uh, it's hopefully seeing more and more likely that the most disastrous catastrophic global warming scenarios can be averted, uh, we are still headed for a much warmer world uh, with much higher uh, sea levels. And even if we get um, uh, um, the uh, global temperature to uh, remain below 1.5 1 degrees centigrade uh, plus uh, or above the, the pre-industrial average, which at the moment, unfortunately, seems unlikely. Even in that optimistic case, uh, the sea levels will continue to rise. Uh, so the sort of some level of sea level rise has been already locked in, no matter what we do. And if we are unable to stop 
uh, the global warming uh, getting out of hand, we can see some really extreme uh, sea level rises on a long time period. Uh, so this goes all the way up until 2300, and you can even go beyond that, uh, like what would it mean if all the uh, continental ice caps uh, or continental glaciers and ice caps would, would melt. So um, I could talk about this the whole day. This was a complex and interesting project to do with, with um, a lot of people involved, uh, four programmers uh, and me and Jonathan as sort of data uh, and uh, design experts. And then the artists, Pekka uh, Nittivertan and Timo Aho. We used uh, the coastal DEM, DEM meaning digital elevation model uh, put out by the Climate Central. Thankfully, this new model came out just when we were working with this because the previous RTM elevation model uh, proved to be much uh, too coarse and also include a lot of pretty essential errors um, th that we were sort of fearing that we would have, have to abandon the project. But thankfully, uh, a new the digital elevation model came out uh, just when we were working this. So the point here, why I want to showcase this project when talking about comparison is uh, the sort of uh, uh, aspect of familiarity. So the idea with this project is that you can obviously go to any place in the world and see how the sea rise would affect that area uh, in the most catastrophic of, of scenarios. Uh, how many people would be displaced? Um, of course, this doesn't take into account how the population will develop over the centuries, but but if, if uh, the population remains the same as it's now, how many people would be displaced? And uh, what I think is sort of the killer app within this uh, project is that um, originally we planned that you could go to any location in the world using Google Street View and then using the slider uh, see where the sea level could be in that place in, in the worst scenario. Um, so this is uh, Venice, for example. Unfortunately, uh, this proved harder than we thought. So when you try it in the place like a Venice, you get really wonky results. In, in some cases. So unfortunately, uh, it was then decided uh, that we can't do this for every single location in the world, but only for this Google Photospheres, which are here marked with the blue dots. So you can find them around coastal areas. Obviously, Slovenia is, is uh, uh, too high to be directly affected uh, uh, with the, the sea, sea level rise. So no uh, uh, locations for Slovenia, but for example, for Croatia, you can already find, find a few of them. And this is how it looks uh, if you go to, let's say, in this case, New York, and, and uh, see how much the sea level would have uh, risen in that particular location. I think this comparison to something that's already intimately familiar to you as a reader or a viewer is uh, really impactful and powerful uh, and, and works uh, really well to drive the point home. Now, the problem with this approach that we took is that it's way too complex for most use cases. To quote Arsid Tse, who's a um, graphics editor at the New York Times, uh, in 2016, uh, he said uh, at Malafia conference, uh, according to the research, readers just want to scroll. Uh, less than one uh, out of five readers in the New York Times, whose readership is really, uh, you know, well educated, uh, very committed in in many senses, even from that very sort of uh, highly selected readership less than one fifth of the users were interacting with their rather beautiful complex interactive visualizations in any other way than by scrolling. Uh, we have just passed an important, uh, uh, sorry, a fifth anniversary of a very important landmark. So in uh, October, 2016, that was the first month ever when mobile web traffic uh, over overtook uh, desktop users on the web. And uh, year by year, everything that we do digitally is happening more and more on the small screen, not the big one. Uh, this has really important implications on how uh, visualizations need to be structured. And things like this, although uh, beautiful and impactful for the few that actually go to use it, uh, it does work on the mobile, I'm not saying that, but uh, it requires uh, ways of interaction that are maybe not uh, as commonly available as we would like to uh, when putting out our message. So back to the relationships that can be visually compared. If your data doesn't include any of these visual structures, uh, you can often still visualize it by somehow converting it into a structure where, where these comparisons are possible. With numbers, if you want to create numbers uh, for your qualitative data, you can count occurrences, you can score, 
things. You can give uh, points or values to, to different qualitative things. You can rank things if you uh, want to do visualizations by rank. Uh, you can position things uh, in, in physical space, either geographically or in, in smaller scales. Uh, if you want to do location-based visualizations, you can use dating, not meaning the kind on Tinder, but, but for example, carbon dating in our, uh, our, um, archaeology meaning that you have a date for something when something happened, and then that can be visualized. You can categorize uh, your qualitative uh, points of information, and you can look for connections within a data set. Just to show a couple of examples of visualizations where we have done this. Um, here, unstructured uh, data, meaning text uh, from the minutes of Helsinki City Council, uh, um, a particular meeting have been converted into word counts and then associated with council members votes. So this debate was about a tunnel that's actually uh, in the news uh, as we speak once again in Helsinki, but in 2018, there was a zoning change that uh, managed, uh, that, that uh, was passed and then uh, the sort of planning for the tunnel in question went, went ahead and now it's the plan exists and now the debate is whether it actually should be built, but but this was the starting of the project, and uh, we have uh, used a lemma tizer, which is a piece of software that finds the lemma or the dictionary form of each word. Uh, the, the lemmas have been calculated, and we've created a visualization where they're located in these bubbles, a bit similar to a word cloud, but word cloud um, suffers from the problem that uh, word, different words are of different length, and it's hard to visually compare a long word and a short word, uh, because um, a long word will look larger in the same font size than a short word. So we work around that by using the bubbles instead. We're scaling the bubbles. This is translated from the Finnish original, obviously, to English. And we can also see uh, which arguments were used to either uh, support or oppose the, the zoning change, uh, because um, the bubbles are located the further left you go, uh, means that they were uh, more preferred by the council members who opposed the uh, zoning change. And the words that are further right from the vertical line here are the ones that were more used by those who were in favor. So we can see something about the arguments that were used to either support or oppose the zoning change. Um, here we have data that's already numerical in nature. It's uh, play counts which have been scraped um, from Spotify's top 100 list. Scraping means basically using a piece of software to collect information that's in a human readable format into a format that's machine readable. So for example, going through a big number of web pages and collect information from there automatically. So here we have some, some uh, play counts that have been scraped from Spotify top 100 for Finland. And then that information has been categorized so that we can see which broad genres, pop, rock, hip hop, electronic, or something else are popular and also whether solo artists, duos or uh, groups or bands of more than two uh, members are, are popular. And as you can see, it seems that uh, for, for the uh, period covered by the data 2011, uh, I think uh, to 2021, uh, clearly solo artists dominate and very few uh, top 100 artists in Finland who, who are uh, larger than two members here. And of course, um, milestones in some, some interesting um, peer process here, for example, in combating homelessness in Finland, presented in a timeline. Once again, very uh, classic approach in visualizing history. If you're interested in timelines, I highly recommend uh, Daniel Rosenberg's and Anthony Grafton's Cartographics of Time, A History of the Timeline, a great book uh, by Princeton Architectural Press that walks you through the history of the timeline itself. Um, so why these particular ap approaches? Why uh, are, have the visualizations been the made, uh, um, made in the way that they have been made? One guiding light uh, in our own work, at least, is the theory of visual variables, uh, first proposed by Jacques Bertin, a uh, French cartographer in the late 60s, and then expanded upon by other cartographers and statisticians and perception researchers. Um, so Bertin uh, noticed that um, we only have a limited amount of um, visual encodings for the, for the information that we want to present. And these encodings have an opti uh, optimal uh, or like an order of preference. So, so using position to encode uh, numbers, for example, is always the best option, uh, meaning that we, we are able to make most uh, correct judgments about the values being presented and, and notice uh, the smallest changes and so on. Uh, length is also a good uh, visual variable for showing numbers, but uh, then the other ones, angle, slope, area, 
are only adequate, meaning less good, and then some of them are poor or not at all suited for the purpose. After Bertin, uh, Jock McKinley in late 90s noticed that this order actually changes if we present data on an ordinal scale or nominal scale. Position remains the best uh, option, but, but the other ones uh, uh, change from that. Of course, what we see here is true only for people with so-called normal uh, vision, which in fact may be a minority in your uh, audience, depending on what you're doing, of course. Uh, in many cases, it's true that uh, people who have no uh, uh, limitations to their vision might consist uh, on a minority of, of your audience. For example, presbyopia, which is uh, age-related vision difficulty, also called old eyes, um, um, meaning that uh, when people get older, they have uh, trouble uh, seeing uh, things that are, are nearby. Um, so that affects about 25% of people globally and probably many more in Europe where the population is older than average. Uh, more severe limitations are presented by conditions such as color vision deficiency, color blindness in layman's terms, and a suspectability to the so-called uh, pattern-related visual stress, uh, which is common especially with people who suffer from migraine, epilepsy, or dyslexia, meaning that uh, strong visual patterns may uh, cause uh, even physical discomfort uh, for them, and, and uh, in some extreme cases may even trigger epileptic or migraine uh, uh, episodes. Um, and this aspect, the accessibility of visualization, is a topic that I would love to dwell on. Unfortunately, we don't have the time, uh, but it's an under-addressed uh, topic in visualization that should uh, get more attention. And what's problematic here is that things that are good for one group uh, uh, in accessibility, for example, the colorblind, uh, may be detrimental to another one. For example, using patterns to reinforce the visual message is good if you're colorblind. You don't have to rely on just the color, but for a person who uh, suffers or, or is susceptible to pattern-related visual stress, the pattern can be harmful it, it, in, in itself. So it's a very sort of tricky trade-off question. And, and the answers to these questions, what type of information should be presented in which way are not very sort of immediately obvious. For that reason, we need uh, cooperation from designers, scientists, and other professionals uh, in creating good standards for creating visualizations. This example is from Algemeine Rekenkamer, which is Netherlands uh, Court of Audit, a public uh, um, sector organization in the Netherlands, uh, who have created a very detailed uh, set of visual guidelines for creating visualizations uh, so that they get a clear, easily understandable visualizations that also sort of are on, on a brand in their look. This is clearly made for other designers but we did a similar uh, set of guidelines uh, for the National Institute of Health and Welfare, THL in Finland, which is meant specifically for the experts, the, the researchers and other experts working within the, the Institute, uh, how they can, in the tools that they have, Excel and so on, create uh, impactful visualizations that are as clear uh, as possible. Um, I want to conclude uh, by repeating the quote from Ben Schneiderman, the purpose of visualization is insight, not pictures. Uh, when trying to uh, put your data into visual format, always ask yourself, is it clear? Is it easy to understand? Are we utilizing the best visual variables for it? Have we simplified information enough? Are we making the right comparisons available for our readers? And put down those answers uh, in a format that helps others as well. Don't just uh, create a single visualization and move on, but hopefully uh, collect the information about what works and what doesn't, uh, share it within the, the organization uh, you work in, but, but also um, with others uh, working with similar questions. Uh, that was what I had uh, prepared. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And here is the uh, a link where from you can uh, download the slides uh, once again, if, you, if you're interested. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments you might have at this point. Thank you very much, Yuso. That was uh, amazing. Um, a lot of new things as well. And thank you very much um, for, for um, topics which you tried to cover. I mean, not the topics, um, content which you presented. Some of it was very relevant and very hot mm -hmm. in these days, I guess. Um, I will give a uh, floor to participants' questions. Do, do post questions in chat or just uh, go online, please. You're very welcome to ask questions. 
So hello, maybe I can start sure. uh, to fire it up. Uh, at the beginning, you said very interestingly, and I agree totally with you, uh, that uh, the data is only, let's say, valuable in order mm -hmm. if we are um, getting the knowledge out of it, or mm -hmm. we, can, we can present it or visualize it and get the knowledge out of it. Mm -hmm. But how can we evaluate it? Because as you know, today we live in a world of uh, different theories and mm -hmm. different understanding of this, maybe the same data. Uh, so how actually do we can evaluate this that we are getting, let's say, if we can use this the right knowledge or when mm -hmm. do we say this is the knowledge and this is actually just an interpretation which is yeah. Kind of a, yeah that's a critical critical and hard to answer question and unfortunately I, I don't have the answer to that question but but i maybe have some musings on the topic uh first of all uh, like my approach obviously considers the the presentation of the information and and does it reveal the right things so that's actually something that, that's reasonably uh, easy to test. At its simplest, it just requires you to show what you've done to other people and ask for their free form comments and see if they interpret the, similarly as you do. Of course, that doesn't guarantee against uh, having made some sort of um, ill-advised choices uh, previously before putting into visual format. Uh, so it's of course always possible that, that you create a misleading chart uh, without noticing it. Uh, but if the mm, uh, message that you as the creator of the chart or whatever visualization uh, sort of read in it or find from it is the same as other people who are not necessarily domain experts and so on, see from it, then at least the message seems to be like in line um, and the, the way that you present it is is um, in at least in that sense correct that it doesn't uh, provide too many conflicting ways of interpreting but the larger question of course at which point we can consider uh, our interpretation of some data or information to be uh, a fact and some something that we know for a fact is much harder question to answer uh, I do think visualization and, and uh, data uh, journalism, data analysis, things like this play a part because they democratize the process of um, working with data and, and information. Previously, when the sort of primary way of communicating, for example, uh, research results was at best a table at, and at worst uh, a complex uh, mathematical model that was just presented as an, a set of equations that uh, would obviously uh, sort of exclude the vast majority of, of people uh, from actually investigating whether the claims made in this research uh, stand, stand scrutiny, scrutiny or not. Uh, with things such as visualization, we can at least broaden the audience uh, of potentially uh, critical voices who might find uh, some aspects of the research objectionable, objectionable for good or bad reasons. Of course, that you have an objection with something doesn't mean that the objection is right. But at least the conversation is, is uh, sort of more varied, includes mm -hmm. more voices, and gives uh, more potential, at least for somebody who is in good faith trying to explore whether their research or what the, the information is, is sort of correct. Uh, for, for somebody who is operating on good faith principles, the fact that we can make the, the results more accessible uh, gives more constructive and less constructive feedback as well, which hopefully will drive us more and more to the, the elusive truth, if you want to want to use that word. But but nevertheless, sort of the facts that that um, are not just our own interpretation, but somehow in the world itself. But very good, good and tough question. <laughs> no, but thank you very much. Uh, thank you also for the uh, presentation. It was very insightful, uh, thank you. and I think it's very seminal because. Uh, Whenever we now go around, to, I don't know, even looking the last biennial uh, of mm -hmm. architecture in Venice, it was actually, I think, more or less uh, the information design, uh, how to present the information, mm -hmm. how to ac actually engage public. And it was, I think it's very important yeah. because we are all digging in, but of course the knowledge, how to do this, how to be insightful, how to actually, as you said, um, visualize, not to make just pictures, nice mm -hmm. pictures and so on, but yeah, to make knowledge out of it. I think it's very important. Yes. So thank you very much for Thank you. Uh, your talk. Hello. Hey. Hi. Kitos. Um, good to see you, Stroy. Uh, <laughs> good to see you too. Um, well, I have a question about the data arc 
mm -hmm. uh, because that's like a separate branch from like the data visualization. Yes. And where or how do you see data art as a valuable resource of mm -hmm. information for, for the public? Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting question. And uh, data art as a field, in my opinion, and now I need to underline that I'm not an expert in data art, but, but from my sort of, my, my perspective is more maybe in line with journalism, data journalism, that's sort of where I come from in a sense. Although I have a design background, I sort of identify more with journalism. Uh, so from my sort of limited point of view, data art maybe as a field is not completely mature yet. So, so I, I think we have uh, still not seen the full potential of the art form. Uh, but um, generally speaking, uh, I've always thought that, that uh, one of the many functions of art is to serve as a sort of an R&D uh, attempt for, for design and, and more practical everyday uses of the same things. So things that are tried in the visual arts, often uh, uh, if they are successful, uh, the, the uh, attempts, they find their way into, into more everyday uses. Uh, first, maybe maybe like uh, design at, at the sort of um, uh, at the more artsy edge of, of things, and then uh, finally you have it in IKEA. So, so like I, I believe there there is uh, a, if not a pipeline, at least a potential for ideas that have been tried in in data art if they work. Uh, for them to then uh, trickle down, in a sense, into science, into journalism, into governance, in, into business, wh wherever uh, those those uh, methods and, and tools might find find use from. And, and there are at least examples of this uh, factually happening. So, so uh, for example, uh, uh, news media picks ideas that have first tri been tried by artists in in the. Um, um, a world of data art, and then then put into into good use uh, uh, in, in other other places. Then, of course, data art at its best um, uh, is is uh, like any art, uh, meaningful in itself, and and can uh, create a very strong impression. For example, uh, one very powerful uh, uh, piece of data art is the if you go to to uh, Ground Zero in in Manhattan where the, the Twin Towers used to stand. And there's the, um, uh, what's it called, um, fountain, large fountain at the base, uh, where, the, where the basis of the buildings used to be with uh, the railing has uh, the, all the names of the people who perished in, in the attacks of 9-11, uh, their names, and they're located by proximity. So it's like a network analysis of who works with whom, for example, who were married to whom and so on. And, and the sort of fact that this, amazingly large people of network are all gone is, is a really powerful uh, sort of, um, it, it really impresses you when, when you are there and consider uh, the, the artwork and, and it, it really affects you, you and your, your sort of thoughts about the world. So, so as any good art, data art ha has that potential at its best and, and, and the best examples of data art we've seen clearly, clearly kind of uh, rise to that level. But, um, from from the more sort of practical perspective, uh, the the largest value, in my opinion, comes when those ideas are stolen for for more everyday uses from the field of art. You are talking basically. I mean, it's the same as uh, basic science, which at some mm. point finds practical application, right? Yes, yes, same as science and engineering. I, I say that art, art and design. Uh, sort of have a similar relationship with with each other. Obviously, like there are differences as well, but but like the broad broad idea with with uh, basic science and, and engineering is similar. There's one question from the chat. Let's see. Uh, do you have any experience on when and how to learn uh, uh, children about visual and data literacy? Are there any child stories that embraces this? This is a really good question. Uh, I don't have children of my own. My my wife has. Uh, we've been only only together for for a couple of years, so so I haven't had the opportunity with with our our uh, kids uh, to to uh, try this out. Uh, so so my experience here is limited. I, I would probably need to consult uh, Jonathan, who has has two small children. Uh, but what comes to mind is uh, that um, the the work of uh, Mari Neurath uh, from from the fifties and sixties. Uh, in children's books, I think it's, it's amazingly uh, good use of infographics and uh, simple visualizations for children. So, so Marie Neurath 
uh, made um, a large selection of children's uh, nonfiction books in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, uh, which are cheaply available online if you if you want to uh, get some of those. I mean, some are more, more expensive, but most of them are rather cheap. Uh, so I love those. I'm not sure how, how children today uh, raised with, with TikTok and so on would find the very minimal aesthetic of those, but at least personally, I find them really uh, insightful and, and engaging. But of course, like nowadays, uh, the, the media environment where uh, the children usually exist um, may be different and, and maybe doesn't, uh, the sort of same things does, don't necessarily work with them. Um, there are some some sort of uh, data visualization and data literacy um, books and projects and for children. For example, the Dear Data project by, by uh, Georgia Lupi and Steph um, Stephanie Posovec, um, um, which originally started as just, just a sort of fun thing that they did together and uh, has then uh, sort of branched out into different things. It includes uh, sort of a do do uh, it yourself version. So the idea was with the uh, Dear Data project was that what uh, uh, Georgia uh, and Stephanie um, each, uh, I think weekly, sent a postcard to each other, which was a data visualization that somehow related to their lives. They, they decided on themes and then they did a handmade data, small data visualization that they sent as a postcard to the other. And these are, have been then collected later to a book. But there is also like a do-it-yourself version, which sort of explains like how you can collect data yourself uh, and do simple visualizations by hand. And I think that would be, in my opinion, a really good approach, uh, although it's not specifically meant for children. Uh, but I think it, it's a very good approach that would probably work with children. And then one more thing is that maps are data visualizations, and everybody loves maps, I think, uh, um, including children. So. Um, Probably when I'm at some point uh, starting to um, uh, sneak in the information design and visualization stuff to, to my wife's children, probably map maps are where I'm going to start because uh, I haven't met a person who uh, can look at the map and not be fascinated by it. I mean, if it's a well-made map, uh, maps are so powerful. They, uh, you know, they let you travel without leaving. Um, a well-made map is a beautiful object in itself. Uh, they, they are uh, sort of objects of research. They give you power. You, you are sort of uh, presiding over the landscape and so on. So, so there are so many things about maps that, that uh, people love. Uh, and uh, in my experience, that includes, includes children as well. So I would, I would maybe start with maps. I have one related question, if I may. Uh, so the other people warm up as well. Um, I'm, I'm interested in visual perception success. So, you know, how I know it's difficult to actually um, judge it or, or test it or whatever. Mm -hmm. but I'm interested in it for different users groups. For example, do children perceive differently because of their, you know, we mm -hmm. sometimes say that they lack concentration, special now mm -hmm. because they're all living in digital media. Um, do they perceive differently comparing to adults? Have you come across or met a project with this? focus um a really interesting question unfortunately i have to admit that i have not my, my knowledge of the topic is very very superficial so unfortunately i don't know of, of of research on the topic i do know that there has been research on the topic but i haven't read it i do know of uh, some research made with uh, very small children uh, whose uh, visual sense is still physically developing who obviously have have a different uh because their sight isn't isn't equipped to to handle uh, the sort of surrounding world the same way uh, as as an adult has, and um, we know uh, from some at least uh, case studies that uh, people who have lived in a sort of visually limited environment uh, developed less uh, sort of um, or, or like might be lacking some of the visual skills that other people have. Uh, an example uh, comes to mind uh, from. Uh, uh, a book by what's his name? The very famous psychologist, the man who mistook their wife for a hat. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, one of his books, uh, which is about vision, uh, can't remember the name of that either. Uh, but anyway, uh, it mentions um, um, a case about um, a person who were a native 
I think Brazilian maybe, uh, who had lived a whole their li life inside the forest canopy. So they had haven't ever uh, been to a very large clearing. Uh, I mean, as large as you get in a forest, but that, that's about it. So when they were for the first time uh, took, uh, they, they were taken onto um, a mountain uh, where they could see, for example, uh, cows grazing below, several hundred meters below, uh, he was unable to sort of understand what he was seeing. He could not understand that these uh, objects were several hundred meters away because normal, in, in his normal experience, uh, that simply didn't exist. Uh, so uh, for children who is still acquiring the, the skills to, to understand the world around them, uh, similar limitations probably exist. Uh, and uh, the sort of ages at, at which point these come more or less ingrained uh, probably vary from, from the type of uh, sort of visual thing to another. The, the point here in this particular case was that depth uh, vision is something that, that for a lot of people is uh, underdeveloped. For example, if you have uh, strabismus, which means misalignment of the eyes, which is a very common condition, so that your two eyes are looking in slightly in different directions, uh, that, that means that your depth perception is much more limited or might uh, um, much more limited than, than for somebody who doesn't suffer from the same condition. Um, so I don't know if this applies to other aspects of, of uh, visual perception as well, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, at least for, for very young children, there, there were some, some examples, uh, similar examples. Um, also, we know that if we go to elderly people, uh, who start to have other types of problems with their vision, for example, um, well, one thing that happens to everybody is that the, the lens of the eye gets yellowish when we get older, which means that uh, the uh, color spectrum that gets through the eye uh, is uh, more limited than for a younger person and also slightly distorted. And this happens to, to everybody. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have uh, this age-related uh, short-sightedness, uh, sorry, actually not short-sightedness, but, but uh, age-related vision difficulty. And uh, then uh, some people develop more serious uh, problems in their eyes, such as cataracts, which uh, obviously limit their vision. But interestingly, uh, many people, uh, many people's brains are are so plastic that they work around a lot of these problems, and it may take a while before they are actually even uh, realized that that this person has a problem with their sight. That's pretty interesting in itself. How we compensate for uh, our limited sight. We know from research that uh, um, some sizable share, I can't remember the exact share, but let's say around one fifth or, or uh, fourth of people with color vision deficiency don't realize they have a problem with their color vision because you can actually live a regular life without noticing the fact. If, if you are not uh, working with colors and if you're not particularly interested in colorful things such as art, uh, you might never notice that that your color vision is more limited with, than with somebody uh, who doesn't suffer from the same condition. So uh, this is a very interesting uh, area of research, uh, but unfortunately not one that I'm, I'm intimately familiar with. No, it's fine. I just thought. But in other words, when you were talking about children and experiences, um, basically it means that visual education is very important. Yes, I, they get I would think so. They exposed to different things. They will develop mm. their judgment and everything. Yes, and, and of course, because the simple fact is that, that a lot of things are easier to understand uh, visually uh, when they're presented visually. And clearly, uh, at least I know from, from Finland, that, that considering, comparing when I went to the uh, uh, school in, in the 80s and, and early 90s, compared to that period, um, nowadays, uh, school children and, and also teenagers are presented with much more visual material than they used to be at the time. And also, uh, they do more exercises where they themselves create mind maps, for example. And from the chat, I now noticed that Oliver Sacks, yes, that was the, the person whose name, whose book I was trying to refer. The particular book isn't the man who mistook his wife for a hat. I can't remember the name of the book, uh, but, but it's actually... Uh, if, if you happen to have our book. Uh, th th this uh, is the uh, title of the book as well. Yes, yeah. that, that's yeah. right. That, that, yeah. That's his most famous book. Yes. Yeah, 1985. So yeah. Yes. And uh, also the opera was then made out of it. I, I yeah. just read on Wikipedia yeah. <laughs> because I, yeah. I really like the titles. So. Yeah. So this is his most famous book, but the book mm. I was referencing mm, okay. is called something else. Um, 
uh, it, it can be found in the reference list for our book if you happen to have <laughs> that hand if you go for s for sex oliver there's the, there's two books one is island of the colorblind but it's not that one it's the other one but in any case um yeah mm -hmm. oliver sacks has, has written um, actually several books that, that deal with the topic mm -hmm. of of um uh, limited visual perception one way or another which is super interesting his per perception or like point of view is obviously that of a, a neurologist so so he's interested in how that affects uh, and is sort of um worked around by the brain but but the things uh, are uh, very interesting from from sort of a practitioners like a designers uh, uh or artists point of view as well well i don't know are there any other questions Yes, it is. Okay, so I, can, I can read it aloud. Um, the real life world can be visually represented in various ways. Is it possible to decide in which context photography is more informative than simplified visualization, for example, an illustration, and will be understood more holistically by the majority? Are there any cultural differences in understanding different types of visualizations? A very good question, or actually two questions. <clears throat> um, I'll try to answer them. Uh, not not very easy ones, but uh, very good ones. So uh, for the first question about the role of photography, I think a very good quote I, I, I like to uh, quote uh, is Sven Liedemann, who was a Swedish uh, or was a Swedish lexicographer, meaning a dictionary editor, and uh, he um, put it quite quite succinctly when he said that um, the purpose of the uh, graphic, meaning an illustration or, or, a, or a infographic, the purpose of a graphic, I, I think actually he used the word uh, drawing actually here, but what but, but he meant is illustrations and in, infographics. The, the purpose of an illustration is to explain what we see in a photo, and the purpose of a photo is makes us uh, to make us believe what we see in illustration. So the power of the photograph is in it that it seems real. It, it's sort of uh, evidence. It, it's about this actually happened. Of course, we know that photographs can be uh, forged and, and are forged very, very commonly, especially outside the news. Uh, but but in, in the, for example, advertising, we know that uh, photographs presented in advertising are, are rarely real in the sense that they would be sort of accurate representations of, of anything that exists in the world as such. But still, photographs feel real. Uh, and in the news, for example, because, because there are strong ethical standards about how photographs are used, they retain their power of being somehow true and real. Whereas an illustration or other type of infographic tries to uh, explain uh, concepts and issues on a more sort of, um, uh, sort of rational level, like this is, this is like how this thing has been put together. So for example, um, we, can, we can show like uh, the end product of, let's say, let's say a bottle of wine, a good bottle of wine, uh, and it make it sort of look appealing in a photograph, like, hmm, that looks like a good bottle of wine. I would maybe want to drink that. And in an illustration, we can explain how the wine is made. We can explain the process of fermentation or, or uh, the, the larger process of, of you know, cultivating and collecting the grapes and then uh, creating the, the mash and, 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 and so on and so on. So um, the purposes uh, of photograph and illustration in my opinion, are are slightly different. I'm, now I'm talking about the so-called infographic illustration, meaning the sort of uh, explanatory illustrations. Of course, there is a different genre of editorial illustration, meaning these so-called uh, mood illustrations or or um, sort of um, th that are very commonly used in in uh, news, um, not news media, but but other types of media. For example, lifestyle media, where the idea is not necessarily to explain anything, but just set the mood right. And, and in that, a photograph and an illustration can work as well, depending, of course, what you're trying to say exactly. But, but in that particular uh, use case, where you're trying to sort of uh, convey values and moods and other sort of concepts in that sense, uh, in that use case, photographs and illustrations can serve in a similar role. But uh, then, uh, an illustration can never have the sort of evidentiary power that the photograph has. Um, we all know these famous photographs uh, from history about, let's say, the Hindenburg disaster or, or the liberation of Auschwitz uh, with, with the starving inmates. Um, these photographs have power that could never be matched by an illustration. 
uh, because they feel real, uh, even if in some cases, some of the most iconic photographs in the end were set up one way or another. Like for example, the Marines putting up the American flag in Iwo Jima wasn't a spontaneous happening. It was sort of set up for the camera, uh, but still it feels real. It has emotional power. Um, and it seems like a record of things that, that have actually happened. Illustration can never do that. Uh, but what illustration can do, of course, is first of all, show things that cannot be photographed. We can illustrate things that don't exist or, or, or don't exist yet, or, or are, let's say, on a different planet or something, or, or a different period of history, so they can't be photographed. And then, of course, illustrations can be constructed uh, in a way that can be more uh, explanatory than, than a photograph. You have, uh, in, in history, um, also examples of photographs being used for the explanatory purpose, um, especially in the post-war period, 40s, 50s, uh, six, early 60s, you, you can find these really well-made photograph-based explainers about, for example, how to, um, I don't know, for example, um, uh, service a uh, engine. So you have photographs of the engine from different angles and saying that you you do this and you do that. But but mostly that has been superseded in more modern use cases with illustrations because illustrations tend to be clearer. It's harder to construct from photographs an explanatory um, um, sort of message in the same way that you can do with illustrations. Um, so in my opinion, when you're trying to explain something, Oftentimes illustrations work better, but when you're trying to convince somebody, then photographs usually work better, almost always. Uh, photographs can be used to explain, but it tends to be tends to be harder. There are definitely use cases where photographs work better, uh, even in some of those use cases where where usually illustrations are preferred. Uh, the second question: Are there any cultural differences in understanding different types of visualizations? Uh, absolutely. Uh, research is lacking here. Um, um, cross-cultural understanding of visualization has been researched pitifully a little. There's very, at least, I, I'm not aware of very many um, large-scale uh, um, re research projects on the topic, um, but obviously, like, we know uh, that some um, groups of people are simply more exposed to some types of visualization than others. Um, for example, um, the first time when a uh, bar chart was used in a newspaper was in 1849, when the New York Daily News, uh, sorry, line chart, presented a line chart that uh, showed cholera deaths in New York uh, over a period of, of, I think, one year. And uh, when it was presented in the newspaper, there was an explanation of how to read this graphic that was larger uh, than the graphic itself, because line charts were so alien to, to newspaper readers back in 1849. Nowadays, if you put a line chart in a newspaper, you don't need an explainer, like meaning that when the dot is higher, it means a larger value and the dots that are connected are the ones that are, you know, following each other in time and so on and so on, because we have been exposed to line charts for such a long period. Um, so uh, what we see in the news uh, presented by the government and also by, by entertainment and the arts and so on, has a large impact on, on what we learn to read. Uh, and for somebody like me who, who is immersed in visualizations, it, it can also le lead to this sort of, um, how we call it in Finnish, a speed blindness. Like you don't understand how fast you're going because you've been going so fast for so long uh, that, that we think that these are really easy to understand for everybody because we are exposed to those all the time. But, but our audience in many cases is not. Mm. Um, but definitely something like, for example, maps. Maps are pretty universal. Uh, most sort of cultural spheres have had map making, even many cultural spheres where uh, writing was not known. Uh, but still, the way that those maps were constructed and for what purpose uh, has varied from one culture and one period to another. So, uh, for example, um, I, would, I would argue that for uh, uh, European readers, for example, might be more familiar in reading maps than, than some other. I'm not saying exactly which cultures, but, but like what I'm saying is that Europeans, European uh, newspaper readers, European uh, populace at large has been exposed to maps uh, for generations uh, to a very large extent. So, so most of us are pretty familiar about how maps are read. We are thought that in school, at least in Finland, how maps are read and, and so on. 
and this might not be true all over the world. I'm not saying that that you know maps are a European thing. They definitely are not. Chinese cartography uh, has you know a long head start to, to European, especially if we uh, consider geographically accurate maps uh, that that um, are based on measurements and not just you know descriptions of, of things. But uh, but but still, the the amount of exposure to different types of visualizations plays a large part part here. So far, the evidence uh, or like the, the information about this is mostly circumstantial. And it's like something that, that you learn from a colleague in a different country when, when they say that, oh, in our country, we are used to seeing these because our governments put this out and has been doing so for 20 years or something like that. And, and that, that's the level of knowledge as far as I understand. Uh, but, but definitely an area that, that would merit more research. I will jump in here. I think these culture in, in uh, differences, they're also related to um, writing systems and typography, you know, because non-Latin um, is all written from different, you know, it's not, mm -hmm. not necessary from left to right. And that clues or rules uh, for visualizations were mainly, um, of course, um, uh, developed in Western, yes. Western world, let's say, in, uh, which means Western colonization came, mm -hmm. you know, to other countries and it's basically imposed from the up you know and mm -hmm. only now i think maybe they are developing their own uh, versions which mm -hmm. are maybe more understandable for a population because they're used to read yes. from different directions and uh, that that's all connected and i think it's a very good thing to mm -hmm. have in mind if you are developing something for yes measures. yes and to add briefly to that is that this can also cause like confusions and conflicts for example as far as i understand Israeli newspapers vary from one newspaper to other, whether the time they use in their charts goes from left to right or right to left, because many of the readers also read European or American newspapers and have sort of been uh, ingrained with the idea that that uh, in a line chart or a time chart, time goes from left to right, but then the Hebrew is written from, from right to left. So, so depending on which paper you happen to pick up, the same chart might be mirrored in one of them, which probably can be a bit confusing. Ah. A question from the chat. Do you think that environment dictated by the short text services, image-based social platforms, and so on will lead to a total visualization of communication? Um, no, I don't think that it's going to lead to a total visualization of communication. Uh, clearly, uh, visual communication becomes more and more important, but there are still things for which text uh, um, will outperform uh, pictures, even in of course, like I'm not even talking about like just science or, or 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 governance, but even in everyday situations, there are simply things that are easier uh, easier to explain in in uh, writing than than in a visual format. Um, what's interesting though is that clearly, like speech is uh, uh, sort of um, coming to the space which was previously dominated by writing. So, uh, for example, if I I'll look how my uh, wife communicates with 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 her children. Uh, uh, some of them prefer uh, to send uh, voice messages instead of writing what they're saying. But but clearly there are like codes in this as well. Uh, so um, you can only send and listen to a voice message if you're in an environment uh, where you can use voice. And at least so far, uh, our culture considers it rude to to talk. Uh, allowed in, in certain situations, such as when you're in class in school, for example, or, or um, let's say in a, in a, at least in Finland, it's, it's considered a bit, bit rude to talk in a, in a packed bus. I don't think this is necessarily true all, in all the countries, but in, in our country, at least, you're so, sort of supposed to remain quiet and glued to your screen and not, not talk. Of course, if you are with somebody, that's okay, but, but not send voice messages. So, so clearly there are, there are uses for writing uh, especially um, if you think it broadly, uh, like a, a spoken and written language, but but within that also also written language. But but the, the, I think the observation is correct that that we are cons consistently uh, becoming more and more visual in how we communicate, and um, I don't see that wholly as a, as a positive thing. Although I'm a sort of a visual person myself, but I would prefer some of the information rather in text uh, myself than, than in visual visual format, depending on, on what's what's being presented. Uh, like forecasting what's going to happen in the future with the next and next generation um, is, is of course uh, a false game. It might go to some 
completely different tangent than we can't imagine at the moment. Uh, but at, at the moment, I'm, I'm not uh, at least predicting the, the disappearance of, of text. But, but clearly, communication is becoming more and more visual and uh, um, services like, like Instagram, TikTok, uh, and others are driving it. On the other hand, we have a completely text-based or nearly completely text-based uh, services, just as Jodel as well. Uh, I, I know you can use images on Jodel, but at least in Finland, people seem to be mostly using it for text. Um, so probably different different developments. Uh, the role of voice, I think, is is probably becoming uh, bigger. But but um, I think all three mediums: text, uh, voice, and image. And video, if you want, as a fourth one, we will coexist. Uh, what the balance between them is going to be, let's let's see. Nobody knows. There's another question. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever experienced uh, that there was a need to deliberately blur or poorly present manipulate information? If so, in which case and how? Um, thankfully, not very often. Um, there have been cases where a client uh, has asked us that maybe we could present this in a way that would be sort of make them look better, but we usually said no. Um, of course, uh, there is always this sort of tension, like uh, if you're putting out a message, let, let's say you're a government organization, uh, obviously you're, you're going to want to look as good as possible. And, and it doesn't mean that that we would be sort of for our paying clients as hard as an uh, investigative journalist. But, but if we feel uh, that what we're asked to do is not uh, sort of, or asked to show is, is not true, it it's, doesn't sort of uh, line up with the facts, then we don't do it in, in our work. Um, but the more sort of broader question is not that if we've been asked to do it, but, but are there cases where it would be actually uh, there would be a sort of a justified need for it. I can think of cases where where this this might be true. For for example, uh, well, there is sort of a banal example. But but uh, today uh, about this lecture, when I uh, posted the link on Twitter uh, that I will giving this this lecture uh, and so on, I put uh, I prefer to put the link to the web page of the university to Twitter, not the Zoom link, because there might be some bots that are uh, looking for Zoom links over Twitter, and then probably, uh, for example, the purposes for Zoom bombing, me meaning that they would sort of uh, come to the session and, and blast some some unpleasant stuff to the screen. So for that simple reason, I prefer not to put the direct Zoom link in my tweet. So so that sort of thing exists quite a bit, where where sort of the level of detail you want to give is uh, is a bit bit fudgy or or muted and. For example, we have the, the European uh, GDPR, the General Data uh, uh, Protection uh, Directive, um, which is a pretty important factor in how we can work with uh, people's private data. And that limits, for example, what we can say. We can't say things in many use cases that would reveal too much information about an, an individual. Um, so, so obviously, these kind of things, you, you, they need to protect the privacy of, of some person, sometimes uh, even other uh, legal issues relating to, I don't know, national security or something might come up. Not, not in my job so far, uh, thankfully, but but I, I can imagine cases where where not, not all information can be put out and you need to be sort of fudgy in, in, in that sense. Uh, but um, generally speaking, um, my experience has been uh, Maybe it's biased because I come from a country that's known for reasonably good governance and, uh, um, you know, reasonably trusting uh, populace. We tend to trust each, each other here uh, that I haven't experienced many cases where either I would have been asked to fudge the numbers or I would have felt it would be necessary one way or another. But, but there are use cases such as uh, or like cases such as a privacy. Uh, related things in, in which you can't show everything. And likewise, you need to work around with things such as bots and spammers and so on by not always presenting the exact information, at least in a format that's easily digestible by, by uh, uh, bots. Uh, what about nudge in economics? Um, and it's used by government sometimes for positive changes. Yeah, nudge is, that, that's an interesting concept, definitely. 
um, maybe something that that's not so typical for visualizations. It's maybe something that's the not not the idea of nudging. If you're not all familiar with it, is that um, you, uh, for example, as a government, you gently guide people to a direction that you think is good. Often this this involves things like as changing the default option for something. Um, but it doesn't always work the way you would want. For example, um, at least uh, an example that's often quoted is that in, I um, can't remember which country exactly this was in, but uh, but, but uh, as far as I understand it, a European country changed the consent re regarding uh, organ uh, transplantation after death. So if you die, can your organs be harvested for, for somebody else who's still alive? It used to be so that you need to opt in. So you need to give your permission for the purpose. Then it was changed so that you need to opt out if you don't want it to be done. So by default, you're giving your permission to it and, and you need to specifically say that, no, you can't do this. Uh, what happened in, in this country, unfortunately can't remember which one, uh, was that the, the rate of consenting uh, donors went down because people felt that this was sort of broaching on their liberty to decide about their own body even after death. Um, so it didn't work quite quite as expected. Uh, but however, there, there is a good body of research that, that nudging uh, can be used to, to advance good, good causes. Um, that there are cases where it backfired doesn't disprove the, the main concept of, of nudging, sort of guiding people to do, do better choices. And it, yeah, it, it is sort of fudging in a sense that, that you sort of want to present the option that you want people to choose as, as the better one, even so slightly. Um, but it's clearly a difficult topic. We, we know this from a very topical issue of, of the COVID uh, vaccination, uh, how to get vaccination rates up. Uh, some countries have managed very well, some less so. And I don't think the, the um, explanation lies in, in things uh, such as being able to nudge people toward that or or like being completely transparent about it like it's it's not either of those things it's probably much more complicated which has to do with with deeply uh ingrained cultural factors but also politics uh and especially um like uh this very complex sort of political networks that in some cases uh may be sort of encouraged or even funded uh from outside uh, from in case of Finland from Russia I, I think the same same uh, applies to some other European countries so clearly at least in Finland um, the um, political fringe on the right which is supported by by Russia uh, is is very anti-vaccine at the moment um, um, and it's sort of interesting and weird and uh, concerning that that this thing's happening I mean our vaccination rate is reasonably good it's not a huge issue in Finland, but but still much lower than was was expected because people in Finland tend to be trustful of the government and tend to take up things like vaccinations when presented. So it has been something of a conundrum why uh, the vaccine uptake hasn't been quite as good as expected. Not bad, but not as good as as expected. Um, and I don't have the right answer to that, but but clearly these issues are more complex than issues of communication. Communication plays an important part, but it doesn't solve the, the issue on, on its own. Yes, absolutely. I would agree with that because here in Slovenia, I think the situation is even worse. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. the soci sociology and psychology and everything here comes, I think, um, into play. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe if I just jump in, Petra, uh, thank you yes, very yes. much. <laughs> you, so, uh, we are very happy to have you here. Uh, I'm sincerely hoping that next time we will see each other in person so that we will have the chance also to, to mingle later on and uh, to, to have something good to eat and so on. Uh, but yes, uh, thank you very much. I think it was really insightful. Thank you also for all the questions and answers to, all, to our public and of course to you, Yusuf, for um, being so happy to answer it and uh, very, uh, precise to answer it. So um, yes, sure. um, I'm not sure, Petra, do you have a, a, something to wrap up? No, I'm just very <laughs> grateful for you so to join in and, and help us with this and also for the great discussion. Thank you very much. 
Yes, my pleasure. And uh, feel free to, if somebody here wants to ask more questions or continue the conversation, you're going to find me on Twitter. The, the handle is there. Uh, I'll be really happy to continue from here. Uh, not necessarily immediately if you don't have anything in mind, but if in three months you come up with a question you should have asked now, feel free to, to fire away. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff.